Our first scripture reading comes to us from the book of Genesis, the book of origin stories, and here we come to chapter 32, which is an origin story of sort. The same night, he got up and took his two wives, his two maids, and his eleven children, and crossed the ford of the river Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream, and likewise everything that he had. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket, and Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, Let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, You shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, Please tell me your name. But he said, Why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. The sun rose upon him as he passed the mule, limping because of his hip. Our second scripture reading brings us another origin story of sorts. This one comes to us from Acts chapter 9. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found anyone belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Said, who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, because they heard the voice, but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. For three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. He answered, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has the authority of the chief priests to bound all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, Go. For he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles, and before kings, and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on your way here, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from his eyes, and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized, and after taking his food, he regained his strength. Friends, this is the word of God for the people. 
I remember a few years ago when I first heard about this little musical, a musical that was making some waves all about Alexander Hamilton. Now, he may be on the $10 bill, but he has not gotten this much airtime in pop culture since a few years ago with those milk commercials. Does anyone remember those? And even then, it was Alan Boe who really gets the spotlight. Now, of course, we love a good origin story, and Hamilton's has it all. As Lin-Manuel Miranda writes, he was a bastard orphan, son of a whore, and he later grew up to be a hero and a scholar. He got there by working a lot harder, by being a lot smarter, by being a self-starter. Basically, Hamilton was a hustler. He's not the only hustler who went on to make a name for himself. This narrative from Jacob's life is not the origin story of Jacob himself, but it's the origin story of his other name, Israel. Here, Israel is born out of a struggle by the river. Now, Jacob had been struggling and striving and hustling since before the day he was born. He and Esau were fighting even in the womb, but it was Harry Esau who emerged first, with Jacob grasping at his heel. Poor Rebecca. Jacob was always two steps ahead, scheming for a birthright, plotting for a blessing. And even as God confirms the covenant made with his ancestors, Abraham and Isaac, Jacob is scheming to add more and more to his receiving end of the blessing before he says to God, okay, I will go with you. Jacob spends his whole life hustling, and like Alexander Hamilton, it costs him dearly. Now Saul, on the other hand, was already a rising star in the Jerusalem Council. His pedigree was impeccable. He was circumcised on the eighth day, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, blameless under the law, as strict as any Pharisee in observing it. He was climbing that religious ladder, and nothing shows this as clearly as his tireless pursuit of any and all professing to follow the way of Jesus. Saul had every advantage, but he was still hustling his way up, trying to earn God's favor. Jacob, Saul, Alexander, they are three brothers from different mothers hustling their way to success. All three are on the move. Jacob is crossing the river. Saul is trekking to Damascus. Hamilton is on a ship bound for New York. Just you wait. Just you wait. The world will never be the same. Hustlers are always on the brink, aren't they? They are always reaching higher and stretching further usually until the hustle catches up with them. Jacob is already running. He's running from Laban, who he tricked out of a fortune, and now he has to face Esau. He has to come face to face with the one with whom he shared a womb, the one from whom he has taken so much. The hustle is about to catch up. Saul was breathing murderous threats hot in pursuit of any who were following the way of Jesus. He was jockeying for power and importance within the religious structure, and I think he honestly thought he was doing God's work. But all of that hustle was about to catch up. Both were on the cusp of greatness. Just you wait. Both knew in their bones that they were destined by God for big things. Just you wait. And then the hustle caught up with them. After his meeting with Esau, Jacob recedes into the background. His children begin to take the spotlight. His children, who, by the way, seem to have inherited that hustling gene. 
His beloved wife, Rachel, dies. And he mourns the loss of his favorite child, Joseph. The hustle has caught up. Saul is blind. He's fasting. He's praying. He is waiting on God. And God's response is not what he expected. The hustle has caught up. But just you wait. Just you wait. God did use both Jacob and Saul to shape the world as we know it, and the world will never be the same. Jacob birthed a nation, and Saul brought the gospel message of God's love in Jesus Christ to all nations. That Hebrew identity that was such an important part of him was eclipsed by his ministry as Paul in the Greek and Gentile world. Both Jacob and Saul lost much of the identities that they had worked so hard to cultivate. But in the end, the world knows their name because of what God accomplished in spite of the hustle. These days, so much of life is hustling. The gig economy encourages it. Work harder, be a self-starter, it helps if you're a lot smarter, but that's certainly no guarantee. There is so much content out there. Self-publishing has never been any easier. Anyone can start a blog and start to earn a little bit of money off of it. Think of the names that we know today because of their hustling into the spotlight. The Kardashians are master hustlers. YouTube stars and Instagram stars that I can't name, but many can. And then there are women like Glennon Doyle who skyrocketed to fame after humble blogging beginnings, setting off a whole industry known as mommy blogging. The hustle is alive and well. Making a name in the midst of all this noise is getting harder and harder to do. Maybe you don't want to make a name, and that's all right. But all of us want purpose. Some of us find this in parenting and focused energies in raising children the best way that we can. For some, this means carting them around to endless activities and sports and enrichment camps. For others, it might be homesteading or homeschooling or private schooling or unschooling. You wouldn't believe how many options there are. Attachment parenting, helicopter parenting, Pinterest parenting, the hustle is alive and well. Now some people find a purpose in their work or in volunteer activities, but even then the needs are so great. The odds on so many days seem so overwhelming. We question whether we're focusing our time, our energies, our monies on the right things, if we're making any impact at all. When we're gone, will the world still be the same? The hustle is alive and well. But God is everywhere, including in the midst of the hustle, but maybe, just maybe, once that hustle begins to catch up with us, maybe that's just the opening that God uses. Just you wait. Just you wait. When we come to the end of our game-breaking, name-making, world-changing efforts, when the hustle catches up with us as it always does, Our big plans, God's got far bigger plans than those. Our hopes and our aims, friends, aim higher. When we get bogged down by the noise, when we get overwhelmed by the need, when we get caught up in the hustle, God comes in and silences that all and says, just When the hustle catches up, when we are at our lowest, with no reserves, with no plan B, C, D, E, or F, just you wait. 
God's best work shines through in those times. When we are in the pits, when we are at our weakest points, when our weaknesses are on display for all to see, when our failures are broadcast on the big screen, when we least expect it, God's game-breaking, name-making, world-changing work can begin. In and through us, in spite of us, God looks at the hustle and asks, Are you done yet? Because at that moment, God is just getting started. Just you.